I know it's hard to see given how dark it is and how many people are out here, but I'd imagine we are in the middle of about 2,000 people right now. Well, Kevin, we've been marching from the Capitol for about two hours, and it appears as though the protesters are now marching on to I-94. Uh, it is a group of hundreds already on the highway, and it's at least a thousand behind us just marching down one after the next. Right now, at first glance, I don't see much of a police presence down there, but you can take a look at these protesters. This is still largely the same group that we left the state capitol with earlier. That's the same state capitol that's now in the background there. And this is a really tough situation, and it is going to be quite some time, I would imagine, before police are able to get down here and restore some order. You've got what we're looking at here, which is at least a 1,000 people blocking both eastbound and westbound lanes on I-94. You hear chants of our streets and chants of shut it down. And like I said earlier, it just seems like all that emotion that had been building up for this three weeks of the trial and then this verdict today that so many of the people here were so disappointed in, it's all just boiled over now. Josh? It, it does seem as though many more people are leaving the highway, also the area just off to the side of the highway, kind of the shoulder area, and are walking off hoping not to get arrested tonight. So you still have this group that does not appear to be leaving the highway. They he was standing on the corner. The cop jumped out. They tased him. After they tased him, they shot this guy, man. You please back up to the other side of the street. They jumped out with guns. He got scared, grabbed a bottle, and ran. They was tasing him as he ran. They turned that corner and let out like 12 shots. They almost hit me, sir. Okay, sir. Once the guy was down on the ground, they continued shooting. He didn't have no shirt on, so how in the hell he got a gun? He didn't have a gun from what I saw. My uncle stepped out of his car and the bullet went right through here and in his headrest. How did the bullet go this far off from the targeted person? Right in front of the house I used to live it's in on all day. The way that they're shooting, my uncle could be dead today. Either into the backrest. It would have been right through. It's, it's scary, the days that we're living in. They didn't have to kill him, man. There was other ways. They didn't have to kill him. The police is not for us. That's how I feel. That's all I have to say. The tribute is more important than any picture. All right, you're good. It's an opportunity to explain a legacy to a generation that never witnessed the legend. Yeah, he passed away just like Grandpa Bob. Outside First Avenue in downtown Minneapolis, you'll listen to a lot of lessons in Prince history. Mona Mode used to walk him to the bus. Take early era expert Tawaya McIntosh. You guys just know him now. Who says she knew the star long before his star went up downtown. This is when he made it big. Fans like her feel a need to not only teach. Born and raised in Minneapolis. But preach. Prince is our, this is Prince. That's why I'm asking. Okay, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not denying anything no, no, you say. Outsiders. I'm from Chicago. Are willing to learn. What year was that? Because everyone loves the legend. Yeah, we want to hear the stories. But in Minnesota. Purple rain. Fans. You see all these balloons? Feel like they knew him. Saying thank you for the music and we'll miss you. Hi, Michael. My name is Haley, and I'm a volunteer with Hillary from Minnesota. How are you doing today? A small room. Calling around to see people are planning on caucusing I'm on March 1st. Filled with okay. phones and checklists. Thank you. Not the most glamorous scene. Calling people and getting them to caucus. What could be better than that? The job these volunteers say is inspiring. Okay, thanks. Bye. We re reached out at this point to hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans. Good vibes I mean, from every calls like that. You caucus meet people from a broad range of life. This man says he's been volunteering for presidential elections. This poor guy's detained. So since 1980. Four. It's very rewarding in the long term. Okay, you just so never you know just in the short term school, who's right? going to respond to what. Not no longer lives there. <laughs> Whether it's cold calls, it's okay. We keep trying. Or hitting the pavement. These people say traditional communication. Well, I mean, you can just delete an email. You can't delete me. Makes a big difference. <laughs> you can try, but you, it won't work. Social media is great, but if you don't have that personal contact with someone, it's, they're going to be a lot less likely to show up. We need a political revolution. Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders have made multiple appearances in the Twin Cities since announcing a run for president. Hello, Minnesota. Experts say historically, caucus participation hasn't been that high in Minnesota because the race was more or less decided. Bernie is a champion for uh, working middle-class families. But now, they say it's Minnesota's time to shine. Okay, we're on Laurel. 
doing well here really will set the tone for the rest of the campaign season. So they can learn about Bernie. It seems a lot of people are really undecided and we want to help them make a decision. This is really easy to educate yourself. Just go out and have those conversations with, with both Hillary and Bernie supporters. Looking for Mr. Paul Mullen. All right, are you ready? It's time to take the stage. The pressure's on. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hard work and preparation paying off. Excellent. Great big smile. Don't forget to smile. But it's about more than finding a winner. What makes someone beautiful? Meet Michaela Holmgren. She was born with Down syndrome. So you've done a few of these so far. You're becoming uh, really used to these. You're really good at them. <laughs> But that hasn't stopped her from competing in pageants. I'm really good at them because it's my passion. <laughs> I know. She's especially jazzed about making history this weekend. Be like, ah! I'm really, really, really excited. Hi. To help guide her. Oh my gosh! Nice to meet you. I'm Halima. Is Halima <laughs> Aiden? A year ago, she became the first Somali-American woman to compete in a pageant wearing a hijab and burkini. So it's been a year since we last spoke. What has life been like? Oh my gosh, insane in the best way possible. Now on magazine covers, signing with a modeling agency, and doing ads with American Eagle and Nike, Aiden stressed it all started here at the AIM Center. It's not just a pageant to me, it's my entire new world. She didn't win, but a semi-finalist trophy last year opened up doors for her and other young women. A year ago, I could hardly find a, a magazine with a picture of someone dressed like me, so for me to be on the cover, it's just, it's, um, it's incredible. So go stand right there at that chair. How did it go so far? Good. Side by side, these two women are an inspiration. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. Ready or not, the spotlight is here, but Michaela sure is ready to let her beauty shine. It's really fun, and I'm doing more pageants, and I'm proud of myself. But my parents are right crying. <laughs> This is my dream. In Burnsville, Brett Hoffland, 5 Eyewitness News. 1 0, 1 0. These kids are going through some tennis drills at the Hospitality House Youth Development Center in North Minneapolis. Some are better than others, but overall, everybody's having a good time. And learn life lessons from here. You can say no to the devils, and they're after you. And they're very clever. It also doesn't hurt to have world famous tennis coach Nick Boliteri teaching them. Not just to play sports, but to learn life lessons. For over four decades, he's been all about the kids. All right, ready. The organization One, Inner City two, Tennis teamed up three. with the Hospitality House to create programming. Should we play some tennis? Yeah. All right. You want me first? Okay, right here. And this outdoor tennis space for kids. Who thinks they can hit a ball pretty good? Can you get one out of five, or you show it to me? David Wheaton is a former tennis pro and pupil of Voluntary from Minnesota. Very good. So we're basically like almost in a converted parking lot here. But it's controlling the ball. If these kids aren't here, you know, what are they going to be doing? You know, kids, I don't care what neighborhood you're from, you know, you'll find things to do that aren't as healthy and good as this. Inner city tennis is not just about building champions. Take a little bit off of that but also about getting kids active and character building, but most of all, keeping them out of trouble. What this does, it provides the children to release their energy. Not yet. They do better homework. All right, we're going to keep this moving. Take care of themselves physically. Second ball, second ball. Inner City Tennis says there's no guarantee any of these kids will become the next Serena Williams or James Blake. Oh. But what tennis may do is develop the potential of these kids on and off the court. Whoa, way to go. In Minneapolis, Todd Wilson. Thank you. Five Eyewitness News. When the desert light disappears on the Las Vegas Strip, this Wednesday night awakens at a pace that is hard to match. We came from West Virginia. Fueled by the rush of jackpots and for some. Oh, <laughs> oh that's so good. Just pop. You're cushioned the batter, man. The embers of subtlety are lost in Nevada ever since it joined the latest wave of states to legalize recreational marijuana in the 2016 election. Here on the strip, you won't have to walk far to find joints or edibles to buy. And if you're not in the market, you're guaranteed to smell it. It smells great. It's, it's delicious. Great. It's great. That's why we're here. In Nevada, one of 10 states where it's fully legal, 
marijuana is now heavily grown. Each one of these plants is like a newborn baby. No BHO, no propane. Heavily regulated. This is built to be the mecca for cannabis. And heavily consumed. I don't know which way I want to go. My mouth is watering. But this new oasis has triggered unexpected dilemmas when businesses try to find workers. Every day, a, at least one panicked employer is like, hey, I can't fill these positions. Thorin Towler is the head of the Nevada Association of Employers. And I definitely understand that. And first, he says most Nevada businesses kept drug testing job candidates and eliminated anyone who tested positive for marijuana. You know, I started to get calls of first it was, 10% uh, of, of who I want to hire have failed THC. What do we do, Thorne? So then all of a sudden I started to hear 50% of our applicants have failed. And these are people that they had picked. <laughs> it reached the point where one of Nevada's biggest casinos and biggest employers made a change. Caesars. They came out publicly last year and said it would no longer test for marijuana before offering people a job. A spokesman called it counterproductive and said they might be missing some good candidates because of this marijuana issue. It was a huge deal. We test for everything besides THC. The industry here is rejoicing. Yes, yes. In the gradual acceptance. Meanwhile, back in Minnesota. We can't plan soon enough. Christina Hogan is the head of the Minnesota chapter of the Society for Human Resource Management. And the question really becomes, what do employers do? To answer that question, Five Investigates surveyed nearly 150 businesses in every corner of this state, from small mom and pop shops to large corporations in a variety of industries. When it comes to legalizing marijuana, look at this. They are split right down the middle. But here's where the numbers start to change. We found of businesses who test today, the majority, 65%, say they will keep testing even if it's legal. Anyone who fails won't be hired. They could kill someone if they're under the influence. Sharon McCord is a recruiter for manufacturers in Red Wing. Her clients tell her it's all about safety. Do they plan to keep drug testing candidates? Absolutely, yes. No question about it? No question about it. And in some industries, businesses won't even have a choice. Over at Walters Recycling in Blaine, the head of human resources says drivers are bound by the U.S. Department of Transportation's zero tolerance for marijuana. There's a lot of other things that I'm a lot more worried about than that. Because in the eyes of the federal government, marijuana is still illegal. It's the least of my concerns. This is like a first. You guys ready? You ready? One, two, three. But in Nevada, we learned even safety sensitive industries here started to slightly bend the rules. After struggling to fill jobs, Towler says some companies in true Vegas form decided to take more chances and let failing candidates wait a couple of weeks to try to pass the drug test again. How would you describe from an employer's perspective this adjustment to legalized recreational marijuana? I think it's the biggest thing in my lifetime. It's hit every employer because there's not an employer that doesn't have to ask themselves, you know, what are we going to do?